Now we'll uh, resume the board meeting, annual uh, economic development and technology transfer report. And I'd like to recognize uh, uh, board officer uh, Mary Brown for the presentations. Thank you, Regent Richards. Uh, good afternoon. The three regents universities work diligently to develop breakthroughs that help to improve Iowa's economy. Their research-based expertise and business assistance reaches all 99 counties in Iowa. In fiscal year 2018, the General Assembly appropriated $8.7 million to the universities for economic development efforts. In addition, the Regents Universities collectively generated over $1.1 billion in total sponsored research funding, which includes $518 million coming from federal grant dollars. The statistics in the docket item reflect excellent performance when compared to similar institutions. These numbers fluctuate on an annual basis, but generally reflect an upward trend over several years. The Regents University's efforts to help small businesses, entrepreneurs, and the next generation of innovators is nothing short of amazing. Sitting at the table with me today are economic development leaders at the three universities. Each will share their story from their respective campus. Marie Kerbeshen is the Assistant Vice President and Executive Director from the University of Iowa Research Foundation and the UI Office of the Vice President of Research. David Spaulding is the Interim Vice President, Economic Development and Industry Relations at Iowa State University. And Randy Pilkington is the Director of Business and Community Services at the University of Northern Iowa. Marie, will start. Well, thank you so much, Mary. And in uh, communicating with Mary about what you wanted to hear about today, uh, she conveyed that the um, board was interested in a bit of a primer of economic development, technology transfer, and how that relates to the research funding coming into the university. So I thought a good way to broach the subject would be really to give you an example of a, really a classic case of university technology transfer. And it focuses on one of our uh, premier researchers um, out of the Carver College of Medicine, uh, Michael Abramoff. So uh, Michael is in um, ophthalmology and he has a strong interest in AI and trying to figure out how you can use artificial intelligence to provide better health care to patients who have eye disease. So um, Michael, in addition to being a researcher at the university, is also a founder and CEO of the Coralville-based company IDX. And this slide, uh, quite dense, because I knew we didn't have much time today, uh, but I wanted to kind of convey to you the amount of effort that goes into taking the federal research dollars that come into the university, turning those dollars into innovative ideas, turning them into patents, turning them into license agreements, products and companies, and then jobs in Iowa. So in Michael's case, the first uh, NIH grant that came in that led to uh, an innovation uh, showed up in 2004. From there, a year later, he came up with his first invention, uh, disclosed it to the university, and we filed a patent application on it. So that patent took till 2009 to issue, and in 2010, uh, Michael formed his company and the university entered into a licensing arrangement with his new company. Now if you take a look at the timeline, a very, a lot of effort went in to the point where a product reached the market. So in 2017, uh, um, Michael was invited to uh, brief our um, federal congress on innovation out of universities. Uh, and then things really started picking up in 2018. So the FDA approved the, pro the company's first product. Now this product is actually an AI device that can diagnose diabetic retinopathy. So for patients with diabetes, diabetic retinopathy is a very severe problem, and over 24,000 diabetic patients a year go blind from it but less than 50% of diabetes patients actually have an annual eye exam. Even though if you catch this disease early, you can prevent blindness. So there's this disconnect between what we know is best care for the patient and what patients are able to do. 
So this artificial intelligence-based diagnostic can go into uh, primary care physician offices. So instead of a patient having to do a separate eye exam with an ophthalmologist every year, when they go in to have their diabetes checked, they can have their eye checked at the same time. This is the very first ever AI diagnostic approved by the FDA. Uh, the FDA fast-tracked its approval and um, actually released a press release about this earlier in uh, March of 2018 uh, because uh, it serves as an inspiration to other companies moving forward. The other exciting thing about having this diagnostic developed um, here in Iowa is that our healthcare system was actually the first to deploy it for our patients. Um, in talking with Dr. Abramov, apparently Johns Hopkins was really pushing hard to be the one that would make it out first in the gate, but we got it. So not only is it, is it um, University of Iowa technology, uh, but it's also helping Iowa patients here. And with that approval, the company has been able to raise um, a 33 million Series A round to uh, get this technology and start developing other technologies. And with that, they've been able to hire 47 employees, all of three whom are located in the um, IDX headquarters in uh, Coralville, Iowa. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a perfect example, I think, of taking um, research dollars, uh, $10.7 million in federal research funding coming into the University of Iowa. Uh, IDX itself parlayed that into $55 million of funding for the company. Uh, and then, um, you know, 10 University of Iowa issued patents. We have seven more in the pipeline, with the most recent just filed this year. And now IDX, the company itself, is beginning to get its own patent portfolio. Uh, so this, I think, is a textbook example of university tech transfer. Uh, but I also do want to draw your attention to this timeline. With that first NIH grant more than a decade ago, um, and so it takes a lot of effort on the university's part, on the researcher's part, and definitely on the company's part to move these things forward. I also, then, I also want to give you an update on uh, other efforts we are, are moving forward with in, in technology transfer. So last year at this meeting, I was able to tell you about Proto Studios, our prototyping facility in Iowa City. Uh, and I wanted to just give you an update since it's been up and running for a little over a year now. And, and I think this slide really captures uh, you know, how having a prototype studio handy helps us move things forward along the commercialization pathway. So that top diagram there, the line drawing, is often what we will get from our physician inventors. Uh, you know, you talk about and joke about back of the napkin drawings. Well, you know, it's not really a joke. That's what we get. Mm -hmm. And with something like that, you can see where the faculty member is going but I can't patent that, and I can't find a company interested in licensing that. So with the help of Proto Studios, we're able to do drawings and work with the faculty to figure out, okay, what exactly is this going to look like? And then start building physical prototypes, seeing will these actually work in use? As you can see, here's an example of, okay, this one has to go back to the drawing board. Uh, and these sorts of prototypes are essential uh, for us to be able to find companies interested in moving these forward. Uh, but Proto Studios moves much further than a, just a traditional invention and licensing play. Um, a few examples up here. So that, that first uh, medical device is one that will be a, uh, a licensing arrangement, and we are actually talking with an Iowa company right now that, again, with the drawing, was not interested in moving forward. But once they were able to see it a little bit further developed, get their hands on it, now they're able to collaborate with our researchers and um, start developing it and move it forward. But we can also take uh, Proto Studios and benefit patient care. So uh, here's a heart. Here's a heart of an actual patient undergoing surgery. 
and the surgeons were able to have a 3D model of this heart designed so that they could actually see what they needed to do when they were moving forward during the surgery. And I'll, Mary, I'll go ahead and pass these around. Um, Proto Studios is also helping us with student training. So out of our dental school, uh, before you let the uh, dental students practice on uh, patients coming to the clinic, we can actually develop teeth with the same sort of resistance and strength and let them practice filling cavities on these before they get into our own mouth. Um, we've also launched uh, this year a very exciting program called MADE that is actually run by biomedical engineering undergraduate students at the university. So we have some medical devices that um, have a, a small demand, so we're not able to find a third-party company interested in selling them. Uh, so instead, we have a group of students that are working to design them, to print them, to figure out what needs to be done, and then we're actually selling them off of the website. And it's an exciting opportunity for our undergraduates to not only learn about invention and medical devices and what it takes to make one, but what does it take to get it to the marketplace. Uh, but the la and the last two that I want to hand around for um, show that uh, this resource is not just for the University of Iowa. Uh, these two inventions are in the process from physicians from the Mercy Hospital system in Iowa City. Uh, so this is number nine out of 12 attempts, and it is actually a device to help um, seal head wounds for children. So rather than having to, um, I know it's post-lunch, but I'll go ahead. <laughs> rather than having to you know, shave and staple on a head wound, uh, this physician thinks you can use a device like this to actually take the child's hair and pull it in a direction so that you can then use glue instead of staples. Uh, and then this device is if you're operating on a nose but you need to provide oxygen and you can't provide oxygen through the nose, you can provide it through the mouth. Um, I do have a couple of, of slides that just summarize some of the, uh, the funding coming into the university and also some of uh, this last year's uh, technology transfer um, metrics. Uh, but given the time, I think um, I will uh, hold these in case there are any questions on them and pause at this point to see if you have any questions directly for me. Wonderful, and I hope you never need you. any of these devices, but yes. you know, it is a comfort to know that they are there if we need Thank them. you. Well, while they're calling up the screen, uh, President Richards, uh, members of the Regents, it's a pleasure to be here with you to talk about a very important topic at Iowa State University. Uh, I'll mention before I begin that in addition to serving as Interim Vice President for Economic Development, I am still serving uh, as the Dean of the Debbie and Jerry Ivey uh, College of Business. So. Uh, I'm keeping busy. So uh, you'll remember that a little over four years ago, uh, we had a restructuring at Iowa State University where we separated the Vice President for Research and Economic Development, uh, separated those responsibilities into two separate uh, Vice Presidencies, the Vice President for Research and a Vice President of Economic Development and Business Engagement. Uh, and that position actually reports directly to the President of the University, uh, which reflects Iowa State's focus on the importance of this role uh, in, our, uh, in our university. So I thought I'd start just with a, with a couple of, uh, of overall comments. Those are the different parts uh, of economic development uh, at Iowa State, but just a few highlights from our last year before I get to the specific uh, questions we were asked. Uh, Iowa State University led uh, the uh, state with 42 patents issued uh, in uh, fiscal year 18, uh, and we were uh, listed number 83 on a uh, list of the top 100 uh, institutions with patents uh, granted in the United States. That's 100 institutions worldwide uh, with numbers of patents granted uh, in the United States. Our research park is continuing its rapid growth, and you had a chance to hear a little bit about that from President Winterstein, uh, but I'd mentioned that over the last five years, we've doubled the number of tenants at the research park. We've increased the square footage 63% to over 730,000 square feet. Uh, and most importantly, we've increased the number of employees by 80% to over 2,100 uh, employees. 
uh, and with, uh, with actions like DEER, uh, you heard about the groundbreaking from DEER, uh, we expect the research park to continue to grow. That DEER operation is really opening a whole new quadrant uh, of the park for us. Uh, they've taken options uh, to build at least two other buildings out there, uh, and we're going to be able to continue to grow that part uh, of the park. So the questions that were asked were, first of all, to uh, talk a little bit about technology transfer from a layman's perspective. That's easy because I am a layman, so they had to really explain this to me uh, so I could understand this when I took over the job. So, uh, so let's start with, uh, with sort of this chart. Uh, and technology transfer, I mean, arguably, this really is the transfer of knowledge. How are we transferring the knowledge that's created in the university uh, out to the outside world? And there are a lot of ways that we can do that. Uh, publications, uh, that could be your knowledge, new, new knowledge created could be appear in a book. It could appear in a journal article. Uh, it could be uh, provided at a presentation uh, at an industry conference or in an academic conference where others have a chance to hear uh, about this new discovery. Uh, it may be that an industry funded, uh, a corporate partner funded that research, uh, and the technology is transferred to them uh, and they put it to use. Uh, certainly there's licensing, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, where we license that technology to somebody, uh, or we could start up a new company around that technology. But I think the important thing is that technology transfer is really about uh, taking that knowledge that's been created uh, at Iowa State and finding a way to disseminate it broadly to the world, uh, which fits in with the land-grant mission of really doing doing research that's designed to uh, help, the rest of, uh, help the rest of the world. So this gives, this gives you an idea of what the timeline is like uh, for technology. And the federal government sets uh, this, uh, this uh, timeline uh, of technology read readiness levels, starting from uh, technology re ready level one, where you've really just developed the idea, all the way to number nine, which is sales, but not just your first sales, but consistent uh, commercial sales. Uh, two critical parts uh, of this timeline are, are point number three, timeline point number three, where you have proof of concept, because you really have to have proof of concept before you're going to be able to uh, gain funding uh, for a new, uh, a new invention from uh, the private sector uh, or, uh, or other, uh, other, uh, other sources of funding. Uh, another key point is, is uh, point six, TRL six, when you're at the pilot scale, where you now have your idea in operation, up and running at a level uh, to prove that it's, uh, that it's scalable. Now, at the bottom, you see research is really, research funding comes into those early stages. Then there's this disclosure point, and the disclosure point is where uh, a scientist or a researcher is encouraged to disclose to our research foundation uh, that they have a new discovery, and the research foundation can then go about the work of protecting uh, that, new, uh, that new idea. And that protection piece, protection can come in a variety of different ways. It may come through a patent. Uh, it could come through a copyright or it could come through a contractual agreement uh, with the party that funded the research. We contractually agree we're going to uh, keep, that, uh, keep that private uh, among the parties involved. Now, licensing typically happens uh, after that uh, proof of concept point uh, where somebody, an industry partner, may come in and license uh, the technology from us. Uh, and, and that's an important stream of revenue for us at Iowa State. Uh, our research foundation has a $35 million endowment uh, that's been built up over the years uh, from, uh, from uh, patents uh, and others, that, other technology that's been licensed from Iowa State, uh, and that's made that business, self, that operation self-sufficient uh, since 1992. So for broadly illustrative purposes, $250 million that flows into an institution, research has shown, results in about 100 disclosures. So 100 occasions where a researcher goes to the research foundation and says, I have something here that I think is worth protecting. Of those, about a third of them uh, will actually end up being patented or protected in some way. Of those one-third that are patented or protected, about a third of those will result in licensing agreements, could be to a large corporation, could be to a startup, and ultimately only about three or four of those 11 will actually result in meaningful sales of the items. So if you look at 250 million flowing through to three to four products sold, uh, it gives you some sense of what goes on in the pharmaceutical industry uh, in this country. 
So we've been very successful using uh, technology uh, on our campus to help build businesses, build companies, build our, our research park in particular. Uh, and this takes some of the very good stories that we've had over the years uh, in our research park uh, with successful businesses that have been launched. And where you see the iSurf yellow, those are uh, businesses that were based on uh, technology developed at Iowa State University. Uh, you can also see cases where Cirrus was involved in helping a company. And in three of these cases, the SBDC worked with those companies as well. Second thing we were asked was about the impact of federal dollars in the institution. Uh, this slide gives you a summary of the revenue uh, at Iowa State over the last uh, five years. And uh, those highlighted in yellow are areas where we actually receive funding from the federal government. Uh, the federal appropriations line are direct appropriations from the federal government that support things like our Ag Experiment Station uh, and Cooperative Extension. And in this past year, it's worth noting that our federal research funding increased 7.6% in 2018. So what's the impact of that federal research? So uh, for Iowa State, uh, roughly $255 million in fiscal year 18 between the research dollars and direct appropriation. Uh, all of that led to uh, almost $80 million uh, in economic impact here in the state of Iowa. $74 million through payroll, $4.6 million through goods and services purchased, $1.7 million uh, in contracts to help build up the, the research park. We also have the Ames Lab, which is a Department of Energy Research Lab at Iowa State's campus. Uh, that also contributes uh, to the Iowa economy, 20.5 million in payroll, 2.8 million in goods and services. Overall, over $100 million of impact from federal dollars flowing into Iowa State University. Now we also have some programs that receive federal support. Uh, the SBDC, about half of the SBDC budget uh, comes from the federal government, supports 18 FTE, FTEs there. Uh, in the most recent year, the SBDC was involved statewide in creating 293 new businesses. $108 million in capital was raised from their clients. $111 million in sales increases recorded by those businesses. And very importantly, over 1,800 new jobs created in the state uh, as a result of that federally funded program. We also have uh, the Center for Industrial Research and Service. About half of Cirrus's funding also comes from the federal government. Uh, and Cirrus works in, uh, over a five year period, has worked in all 99 counties in the state of Iowa. Over those five years, they, create, they worked with companies that with more than 3,900 businesses in the 99 counties. And those businesses uh, reported economic impact of over $2.3 billion uh, in, additional, uh, in additional or retained sales, uh, new investment, or costs saved. Uh, they also reported, very importantly, 28,000 jobs created or retained in the state of Iowa. Now the above chart shows a county by county arrangement for Cirrus uh, in 2017 where they worked in 93 of the counties. Uh, they worked with 1,700 businesses in those counties uh, and almost 5,000 jobs were added or retained. So these efforts are very important to Iowa State. We appreciate the support of the federal government and the support of the state of Iowa to carry them out. Any questions? Any Thank questions? you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We always appreciate this opportunity to highlight our economic development outcomes and, and technology transfer. I just want to start with two numbers with our program. And for the 19th year in a row, we had projects, multiple projects in every Iowa county with our 12 outreach programs. And we're really am, am, I'm proud of our student engagement. More than 3,000 students about 25% of the students here at UNI are engaged in some way in our economic development or tech transfer projects, whether it be in the classroom, internships, or out in the field. So those are two numbers we're really, really proud of, and it shows our impact across the state. You heard some really impressive examples from our research institutions. UNI is a lot different. We have core competencies that are different, and just the nature of a comprehensive university means that we have to view technology transfer and economic development just a little differently. And I'll go through a couple examples for you. First, with our metal casting center and additive manufacturing, and thanks to those of you that have gone and, and toured this, our role here is to reduce the risk of technology adoption by these companies 
and also reduce the cost so they can get into these new technologies. We work with the small and medium companies across the state that serve as the supply chain to our larger manufacturers. And we work with them to the point where they can gone from demonstration to production ready molds and cores. Where we have now in the state of Iowa have the largest concentration of sand printers in the United States, substantially. And then when you add in Proto Studios and what Cirrus has done with direct metal printing, Iowa is becoming the leader in 3D printing as it is applied to manufacturing in the state. Another example is our painting and coating program. It's really about transfer efficiency. We developed a 2D system and a 3D system. We've trained painters at 120 military bases and depots across the United States. We were able this past summer to take this technology, license it to a startup company, which is now in our incubator, but still remain, have access to all the 2D and 3D systems so we can use it with military painter training. And we can use it in our satellite facilities in six different locations around the country. Another example of technology transfer is with our partnership with the Iowa State University Research Foundation. We've had a formal partnership with them that gets, they help us with due diligence, with patenting, with marketing, with prototype development, with licensing. And if you look on the right, this was our first design model by a faculty member in athletic training for a Lackman's test for your ACL tear and other knee injuries. The one on the left is what we've now developed thanks to work with Iowa State. And not only have we developed this model, because it's not really good to, to be teaching students how to do this on an athlete that's just been injured. It's a little tough to go out there and say, well, I think it's this tear or not, and whip them around. This model now, we have a company that's going to manufacture, and we have a company that's going to sell. So this is a good example of what we take as a partnership for us to, to be successful in product development. Our federal funding impact is also substantially different here at UNI. I'm going to give you three examples. One is our University Center Project, which is funded by the Economic Development Administration. And this pat we have a, rur a rural entrepreneurship initiative in six different regions across the state. The past year, more than 300 jobs and $9 million in private investment. A lot of that's in rural Iowa. Another example of federal funding and impact is the Department of Defense. We have contracts with each branch of the military with their research labs with our additive manufacturing. And a lot of that's done through the supply chain in Iowa. More than $8 million is the value of the, of the final castings that came out of that. So you're producing these molds and cores. And as I said, it's now production ready. And our painter training program. Letter Kenny, Army Depot in Pennsylvania. A lot of the rework of the Army vehicles are there and a lot of their assets. Just Increasing efficiency of the painters there that go through our certification program saved Letterkenny $500,000 a year. So that's the kind of impact. Most of our federal funding goes to applied research, immediate projects, and immediate savings. Another area of focus for you and I is our entrepreneurship. We've graduated 80 businesses into the regional economy, but the number that really we're most proud of is our student entrepreneurs. Of those students, who have graduated into the, or graduated from our student business incubator, three out of four remain in an entrepreneurial venture, either one that they left university with or another one since then. So that just shows you it's not just sitting in an office at a university, they really are doing entrepreneurship. And then the last area to focus on is workforce development. We all know the situation in Iowa with workforce, it's a priority in economic development. We've been very, active with the Future Ready Iowa project. A lot of data analysis we've done with them. We helped create the playbook. And as President Nook talked to you about this week, we had the Future Ready Summit here for the Cedar Valley with 300 people showing up. And now there's a lot of to-dos. We've done workforce plans in regions across the state. Two recent ones are the Cedar Rapids area and in Council Bluffs with other projects going on. And then the Labor Shed project. This is something that was developed 20 years ago at UNI by the Institute for Decision Making. And Director Durham and, and, and Iowa Workforce Development announced that they are going to have statewide labor shed data. And this is going to be based on the model that we created 20 years ago. But at any time now, if we have an economic development project in Iowa, we can pull relevant data on the characteristics of the available workforce to show that we have workers that can, this company, that can support this company. 
And last, economic development does not happen in isolation for any of our universities. Partnering with Iowa, Iowa State, partnering with business associations, partnering with state agencies, it takes all of us to working collaboratively to really realize the impacts that we need for this state and to build a better Iowa. Be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions? Thank each one of the presenters. Appreciate it. I just have one, a, a comment or two. Uh, the freedom of, of expression uh, in the First Amendment to the Constitution is a bedrock principle of the United States. The freedom applies everywhere, and including on our campuses. Iowa public universities do and must continue to allow for freedom of speech. The right to express differing views of any issue is paramount. Our universities will continue to support the expression of all viewpoints. Now I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Rachel Brown, who will introduce our guest speaker. Thank you, President Richards. And I would like to introduce to you uh, Professor P Todd Pettis from the University of Iowa School of Law College Law. And um, I want to start by thanking him for driving up to Cedar Falls. We had intended to have this presentation um, in Iowa City last month and had some scheduling uh, that precluded that. So we are lucky to have him here with us today. I want to just, by way of introduction, let you know he's been with the university for, this, I believe, your 20th year That's is right. going on right now. Um, expert in constitutional law, the Iowa Constitution, federal courts. Um, so I think we'll, we'll be able to get a really nice uh, picture of these issues uh, from Professor Pettis today. Um, but I also want to point this out because I think it's really important that he's been recognized with President and Provost Teaching Award at the university as well as Collegiate Level Teaching Award. So we have in front of us an excellent scholar as well as an excellent teacher. Thank you very much. And uh, I especially want to thank Rachel who uh, represents you very well when dealing with uh, people like me who are kind of come, uh, come speak with you. Uh, I think you'll find my comments very much in line with yours, but I'm going to say kind of what you said at much greater length. Uh, and I want to start just uh, by way, I say much greater, I won't go on for too long, uh, but I, th I think you'll find this interesting and I hope you'll find it important. And I want to start just to set some perspective uh, by underscoring a couple points that uh, one of the leaders of the Charles Koch uh, Institute made in a recent interview with the Chronicle of uh, Higher Education. And she said a couple of things that I think are important and are exactly right. Uh, she said, first of all, that while we do have free speech problems on our nation's universities, they are not proportionately covered to the many, many, many instances of faculty and students working across divides and having constructive dialogue. And she also made the point that this narrative of a, some kind of an epidemic of free speech violations, uh, a false epidemic as she sees it and as I see it, uh, is being used to fuel a larger campaign of antagonism toward the broader institution of higher education. And so nothing that I say today would I want you to uh, interpret as adding fuel to that false narrative. Uh, but having said that, we do across the country have issues uh, with respect to free expression. And it's also true that our universities are not always rising to meet those challenges in ways that are faithful to the First Amendment uh, or to their own uh, foundational principles. So I want to talk briefly about three things. I want to talk first about uh, a couple of reasons why uh, free expression on our campuses might be even more important, it's always been important, but why it might be even more important today than it has been at any recent time in our past. I want to acknowledge and uh, talk about a couple of the uh, sets of challenges that I think administrators 
face when trying to maintain a strong commitment to free expression. And then I want to close by just uh, talking quickly through some of the fundamental First Amendment principles that I think need to feature prominently whenever uh, university faculty and administrators are dealing with free speech uh, disputes. So first, about why free expression is important on campuses. Uh, that proposition almost goes without saying. It's integral to the function of a university that there be free speech. I'll just read you a couple of lines from uh, prior Supreme Court opinions. Uh, one case a little over half a century ago, the Supreme Court of the United States wrote, teachers and students must always remain free to inquire, to study, and to evaluate, to gain new maturity and understanding. Otherwise, our civilization will stagnate and die. About 10 years later, the Supreme Court wrote, the nation's future depends upon leaders trained through wide exposure to that robust exchange of ideas which discovers truth out of a multitude of tongues rather than through any kind of authoritative selection. There are reasons, as I've indicated, though, where I think free expression might even be doubly important today. And so let me just describe those for you. Uh, the first has to do with social media technology and the fragmentation of the news media. With social media technology, which is where young people get a great deal of their news now, you have tremendous control over the inputs. You have great control to decide who you're going to hear, what you're going to hear, and who you're not going to hear. And in the fragmentation of the news media, you know, if you like the Trump administration, there's a network for you where the administration will do virtually nothing wrong. If you prefer a network, however, where uh, the, the Trump administration can do virtually nothing right, there's a network for you too. And of course, there's all kinds of things in between. And so with respect to judgments about what's newsworthy and about how those newsworthy events ought to be covered, Today's college students have great ability to control what they're exposed to, and that means, of course, that at universities, which are in the business of bringing ideas and people really into confrontation with each other and in dialogue with each other, that just underscores the importance of that task. Uh, another reason, I think, why uh, free speech may be more important than ever has to do with the political partisanship that colors so much of life in our country. And this plays itself out, uh, I think, in a couple of ways. One is uh, to the degree that it is true that the opposing sides in our country now see the other side not as misguided but nevertheless partners in self-governance, people with whom it is worthwhile to have a conversation. To the extent we have shifted instead to see the other side as evil, as ignorant, as un-American, and as dangerous, that undercuts dialogue and that undercuts some of the core things that universities are trying to achieve. A columnist in uh, one leading newspaper uh, captured, I think, it well. I'll just read two or three sentences. There's a strong current of dehumanization running in our politics. The rival crew, it turns out, is not only wrong, but evil. And how can mortal enemies embrace the give and take of a shared political project? Only the raw exercise of power can decide between them. The goal is no longer to win arguments, but to crush opposition. And the columnist was not saying this in a happy way, but rather lamenting the state of affairs. And so when you think about how that attitude would play itself out on a college campus, when the speaker behind the microphone is someone you regard as a political enemy, why give them the dignity or the chance to answer questions when you can just shout them down altogether? Indeed, just give the very act of giving them the microphone or even giving them the invitation to come to the campus to speak can in this climate be seen as an act of aggression or as an act of betrayal. So those are real problems, I think, that universities need to, uh, to meet and a staunch commitment to free speech is required in order to meet them. Now, uh, I, of the three things I want to talk about, second was uh, or is uh, challenges that administrators face in trying to maintain that commitment to free speech. We have important constituencies that do not always make that commitment easy. Uh, and I'll start uh, with one. Uh, Senator Grassley, uh, not this past summer, but the summer before, held hearings at, uh, in his Judiciary Committee on this issue. And uh, Floyd Abrams, a First Amendment attorney with, uh, with whom I'm sure many of you are familiar, uh, Senator Grassley's committee asked 
uh, Mr. Abrams, so where do you think this is coming from? What's the greatest source of opposition to free speech on campus now? And he said, well, I have to tell you, I think it's frequently students. And it is students who don't want to tolerate speech that they find offensive or harmful. And it is true that there are a number of studies that show or that seem to indicate that students are growing less committed to freedom of expression. I'll mention one of these studies. In March of this year, uh, Gallup, the Knight Foundation, the American Council on Education, and others reported the results of a survey of 3,000 uh, college students across the country. And they asked those, uh, uh, the, the people, the participants in the survey, you know, do you think free speech is important to democracy? And do you think diversity and inclusion are important to democracy? And they said overwhelmingly, yes, both of those are important. Well, what about when they're in opposition, when one has to give way to the other? Survey respondents gave the edge to in, uh, diversity and inclusion, subordinating free speech. 37% of the respondents in that survey said that they believed that shouting down speakers was sometimes acceptable. 10% thought that using violence to silence speakers was sometimes acceptable, and there's other studies that place that, uh, that number at closer to 20%. Now, it's easy when describing students in this way to kind of dismiss them as these sensitive snowflakes who don't want to be exposed to things that they find uh, discomforting, but I think it's worth stepping back just to understand the nature of the problem about why this might be true. Uh, one, our students, our incoming freshmen, have been raised in a, I think uniquely, uh, but certainly a powerfully partisan climate. Today's 18-year-old freshman was born the year Bush versus Gore was decided. Today's incoming freshman was eight years old when Barack Obama was elected president, and the 2016 presidential campaign between Clinton and Trump was their first that they were able to follow reasonably as adults. And so from their point of view, Whatever we think that we saw in the terms of the tone of debate and conversation and dialogue and so forth, that is American politics and that's what they've learned. And so without surprise, a 2017 UCLA survey found that our incoming freshmen nationwide are now more politically polarized themselves the day they arrive on our campus than at any point in the prior 51 year history of the study. Only 42% now divide, uh, uh, described themselves as middle of the road in the year 2000, that number was uh, well over half. The spread between liberals and conservatives when they arrive on our campus is greater now than at any point since the late Vietnam War. So the dialogue opposing uh, partisanship that we find in the larger society is entering our doors when they, uh, our students come in as freshmen. The other thing that I think it's important to say about uh, our students is they've been raised in a world that uh, the rest of us at this table were not raised in, which is a world of internet, the brutal world, world of internet savagery. Uh, social media and the online environment in which our, our kids today are raised is a very, very different world than anything that I certainly was exposed to. Uh, growing up, and they know the power of words, they know what it is to be humiliated with words, and they know what it is to be humiliated on social media and how enduring messages on, uh, on the internet can be and how hard it is to get rid of them, and the effects of verbal bullying, which is today not, it's a different thing than what it was uh, once upon a time. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for Americans between the ages of 10 and 24, and so they know the power of words. And it's not just, well, that those words offend me. They know how deeply damaging uh, words can be. And so there is a greater sensitivity to them when they arrive on our campus. The second thing I want to say with respect to challenges that I think our administrators uh, face when trying to maintain a, you know, a very uh, loyal adherence to the First Amendment and its demands, we rely on students to come to our campuses. We rely on lawmakers to help support us. We rely on donors. We rely on our alumni. And they all have leverage. And when speech occurs of a given kind on a campus, if those who are strongly opposed to that speech perceive the university as tolerating it, whatever tolerating it means, we're saying that it's okay, we're not gonna throw the student out or we're not gonna defund the group, we're gonna allow it to persist. That poses a threat that, you, that administrators have to, uh, have to take heed of. If you're hosting an art 
exhibit on your campus that features defaced American flags and you get a call from the state capitol from people who are important to your funding expressing the view that this is deeply troubling and how could you be hosting this, that's not an easy call just to disregard. If there's racially insensitive remarks that have been made by a student or a group of students on campus, you know, the First Amendment message of counter speech can seem very feeble. It can, it can seem to communicate a message, oh, you don't get it, you don't understand. And then, of course, you go online and, and you start blogging about what it's, the climate is like on this campus, and before you know it, you've got an enrollment crisis, at least with certain demographics. And so there are tremendous pressures, I think, to be seen as taking a very strong stance against speech that important constituencies, for one reason or another, uh, find unacceptable. Which leads me to my third point, which is, so far as the First Amendment cons is concerned, rarely is a university, a public university, constitutionally authorized to crack down on speech and punish it or try to stamp it out of existence. The First Amendment requirement almost always is much more on the side of toleration. So let me talk through a few uh, First Amendment principles that I think need to feature prominently whenever faculty or administrators are handling free speech controversies. The first important thing to know is that while there are some categories of speech that are not protected by the First Amendment, there's something called fighting words, for example. Fighting words are words that you kind of hurl at someone, typically in close physical proximity, and there's a likelihood that the person at whom you've hurled these words is likely to respond immediately with physical violence. Now, there's a lot of ugly stuff you can say to someone that doesn't rise to that level. And it's been since the 1940s that the United States Supreme Court has given its blessing to punishing speech like this, but it's a case that hasn't been overruled, even though it's now, what, four-fifths of a century old. But So that's a category of unprotected speech. Obscenity, which has a technical definition, that's unprotected speech. Threats, which again have a technical, perhaps narrower definition than you might imagine, uh, that's unprotected speech. Hate speech is not on the list. So it's a cultural concept. It's a cultural concept I think we all understand. It's uh, uh, speech that no one would, uh, you know, wants to be proud of uttering, but it is constitutionally protected, and it covers a lot of really ugly stuff. Holocaust denial. I don't know if you remember the chant from the fr uh, these fraternity guys at Oklahoma chanting a, you know, a vile or racist chant while they're on their way to some event. Uh, absolutely hate speech by any measure. But when you go through the categories of unprotected speech, that speech is probably not on it. It's probably protected speech. Second thing that I want to say, so that, you know, most speech is protected uh, on campus. Very rarely would it fall into a category where the government i.e. a public university could say that kind of speech won't be tolerated whatsoever. Second thing is uh, the, uh, the First Amendment is very hostile to government distinctions based on content or on viewpoint. I think that's a pretty familiar principle. Let me just highlight a couple of ways in which that plays out uh, and uh, has some non-obvious consequences, I think. First, I th it underscores the importance of consistency and enforcement of your rules. Suppose a campus has a rule that says, well, we're, we're not going to let, uh, you can't, you know, you can't chalk on these sidewalks or you can't post on these bulletin boards or you can't put signs here or there or something. It's a rule that's on the books, but it's not really ever enforced. There's no rigor to enforcement. And then the day comes when someone does one of those things and there's some kind of an outcry and someone says, ah, you know what, we've got a rule. We can move in and we can say, let's enforce that rule and we'll use that to take down the speech. In doing that, by virtue of not having enforced that rule before, but enforcing that rule now, you've really laid the groundwork for a judicial finding that the reason you swept in was because you were hostile to the viewpoint that that person was expressing or the content of their speech. So you can have content neutral rules like these, this area, not open for speech. But if you don't enforce it until the day comes that something really terrible happens, you've taken a content neutral rule that was probably going to be a perfectly fine rule so long as you enforced it. And now you're enforcing it selectively and you've opened the door to a finding for having violated the Constitution. 
Another, the second and final thing that I'll mention with respect to content and viewpoint discrimination that's not obvious is that when campuses invite controversial speakers to campus, it is likely that the campuses themselves have to absorb the high security costs uh, that are incurred. Now, this is not a matter of settled law in every circuit around the country, so I don't want to be understood as saying something definitive, but this seems to be the way the law is leaning. And it comes from a case, a United States Supreme Court case, uh, from Georgia. The case doesn't have anything to do with universities, but I'll describe it for you. Uh, there was a white supremacist group that wanted to uh, parade. They wanted to march in protest of Martin Luther King Day and news got out that these people were coming and of course there's gonna be a lot of counter protesters so that there was a need for a high security force and so the Georgia County in which this march was going to happen said to the marchers, the white supremacist group, you can march, we'll give you a permit but you're gonna to have to pay us, reimburse us for the unusually high security costs that we're going to incur. And the United States Supreme Court said that that was unconstitutional to make those with unpopular views have to pay more for their, for their speech than those that for, uh, whose views are more popular. And the court also pointed out, or if they didn't, it's been pointed out subsequently, that if the rule were otherwise, if controversial speakers or their organizational hosts could be required to pay the unusually high security costs, that would tell the opponents of the speaker exactly what they need to do to squelch the event. All you have to do is stir up a very angry seeming kind of response, you know, kind of pump up the amount of security fees that are likely to be needed, and then the government's gonna say to the speaker, well, look at the security costs now that we have, and so we have what we call a heckler's veto. And we do have some cases uh, emerging where courts are signaling directly or indirectly, you're gonna have to absorb these costs. Uh, UC Berkeley last fall, you may remember, there was a, they went through one very unhappy month. They had to pay $4 million in security costs when a string of very controversial speakers were ready to come through. Less prominently, at the University of Washington in Seattle, it, earlier this year in February, the college Republicans invited a speaker who was deemed controversial, and the university said to the college Republicans, We're gonna, you're gonna have to pay $17,000 in extra security fees to make sure that everyone is secure when this individual comes. The college Republicans sued, and they won. The federal judge said this is, you know, this likely to be a violation of the Constitution. We'll have a hearing on the merits later, but right now, University of Washington, you can't impose this requirement on the college Republicans, and the parties settled, and as part of the settlement, the University of Washington ended up paying more than $100,000 in legal fees to the college Republicans for having gone down that road in the first place. Two final points with respect to the First Amendment. Forum analysis frequently features prominently in how campuses do or should uh, evaluate free speech controver uh, controversies. The world of government-owned property is divided up into different legal categories. There's things that are called public forums, like a city park, or a sidewalk, or a street running through town. You know, the, set the streets surrounding this campus, for example, and the sidewalks along them. Those are public forums, and the government has very little power to control the speech that happens there, okay? There's other government-owned property, like the room that we're sitting in now, that's different, and the government has greater degrees of control. And so I won't go into greater detail, but I'll just I'll say government property is not all treated monolith monolithically. And so there's a number of cases, for example, that have to do with campus preachers. Campus not meaning that they're sponsored by the university, but preachers who want to come on and they want to get a bullhorn and they, and they would like to preach, and then some are offended by what they're saying. Those cases can come out differently depending on where the person is standing and what ca legal category that falls on. And so I frankly don't know these sidewalks that are right outside the building. I don't know enough about the UNI campus to know in which category that falls. But I do know of cases where they've said about sidewalks just like that, ah, well, 
this university treats those sidewalks in this particular way, open to the public, so you have to tolerate the campus preacher. There are other campuses where the state of affairs is, courts say, no, no, they're entitled to exclude people who are not members of the university community or haven't been invited by the university committee, so, uh, community. So I just flag this whole notion of forums as an important thing. And then last, the last First Amendment principle, uh, this is not all of them, but these are ones that I thought were especially worth mentioning, the notion of overbreadth. Even in those instances where the government is allowed to restrict speech or punish speech, courts are very careful to make sure that the laws or the rules or the student codes of conduct, if you will, are, ta are tailored very narrowly to those particular instances. And the law books are full of occasions when university codes of conduct have said things like, you know, it, it, it's a violation of the student code. There's one from the University of Wisconsin that was struck down. If you make statements that are intimidating or demeaning, that that's a, that's a violation of the code. That's struck down as unconstitutional. You make statements that are offensive or intimidating or hostile. This comes from, uh, from uh, Temple University. That struck down was overbroad because uh, we go back to those categories of unprotected speech like fighting words or threats. Yeah, there are certain kinds of speech that don't have to be tolerated, but they're very narrow. And when you write codes of conduct, often the impulse is to write very broadly and try to make sure that no one is saying anything that anyone's going to find disruptive uh, or offensive. And those codes of conduct have a terrible win-loss record. They're struck down over and over and over, usually on overbreadth grounds, where the courts say, there is a little bit of speech that would fall within this code that you could indeed constitutionally ban, but you have gone so much beyond that that we're just going to invalidate the entire code. And so in conclusion, my, uh, what, what I would urge uh, when thinking about how to handle free speech, I would, I would urge this to faculty members, to administrators, anyone whose job it is to decide how to resolve these kinds of disputes, is not to focus just narrowly on the welfare of our students while they are with us, but to be very sharply aware of the world that we are training them to enter. Because in the world that they're going to enter, they're going to encounter a lot of speech that they're going to find very troubling, and they are not going to have the power to, to shut it down. They're not going to have the power to punish it or to squelch it. They're going to have to find a way to live through it. And what they need, I think, on our campuses are examples of how you do that. And it is not easy. Okay? And uh, nor do I have a, you know, some magic bullet list here to say, well, to do these things and then everyone will be happy. I, don't, I have thoughts, but I don't have, I don't have magic, uh, magic bullets. But our students need to learn from us in seeing how we handle free speech disputes and by our example, learn for themselves how they, once they leave our campuses, uh, can thrive in a world where there is an awful lot of ugly speech that they might very well wish didn't exist but nevertheless, there it is, and they have to find some way to deal with it. Thanks very much for your patience, and if you have questions, I'd be eager to hear them. Richard Lindemeyer. Uh, in this last discussion that you had about overbroad protection, what advice do you have for universities or institutions that have to draft language in harassment policies to protect students that include being using harassing language or demeaning language or things like that. How, how do you draft a policy then if it's not protected? Yeah, no, that, that's a very good question and, and uh, all the campuses are served by general counsel's offices that are well equipped to do that. But in a nutshell, there is a, con there is a category of speech called harassment uh, that's likely not protected by the First Amendment, but it's narrow. It's not speech that someone would find bothersome or offensive or uh, even you know, deeply troubling. It, it is a very high standard. It has to be severe, it has to be pervasive, it has to be speech that when you look at it, what it really is amounting to is a denial of access to this facility by virtue of that speech. So does, you know, is it speech that you can just kind of walk on by or you, 
Okay? Or is it, you know, when this kind of speech is allowed to occur, basically I'm being denied access to this place. And there are a lot of cases that spell out the details that can help mark the line about when that line is reached. But if we're talking about harassing speech, that's what we're going to be narrowly focusing on. And you can understand, it. I can understand, why, uh, you know, colleges and universities across the country would want a broader definition than that because what that leaves students having to endure is a lot of speech that's troubling, that's going to be upsetting, and that, you know, it will not be easy just to kind of brush off. It will be problematic speech, but the law as it stands today nevertheless renders it protected. And so uh, it, it is a chance, it's not impossible, but it is a challenge then to write codes of conduct. You can't fly by the seat of your pants and say, you know, if someone, you know, speech that people are going to regard as hostile, speech that people are going to find as deeply offensive is bent. Those, I can guarantee you, will be struck down as unconstitutional. It's going to have to be more narrowly tailored than that. Any other questions? Thank you so Thank much you. for uh, having me here. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to reintroduce. Reintroduce Rachel, uh, 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 yeah, who is going to once again then introduce different speakers. Rachel, go on. Thank you, President Richards, and I'll share a few words with you this time around as well. Um, we're going to give our strategic plan update. This is something we do annually, and uh, this time around, we are going to be giving you an update from the special schools from each university, as well as an update on the board's strategic plan. Um, which sort of overarches with all this, and we're about right in the middle of our five-year strategic plan right now, 2016 to 21. Um, so we're, we're about halfway through that time span. Um, I want to urge you, I've had a chance to look at, in more detail at all these, and I want to urge you to think about um, and sort of use uh, the vision statement that we have for the board as part of our strategic plan and mission documents um, to help you sort of frame up how you look at these today because I think it gives us a nice um, barometer of what are we aiming for. Um, so I'll just, I'll read it to you quickly. The vision state for the Board of Regents is this. The vision of the Board of Regents is to be a leading system of public education with affordable access whose faculty, staff, students, and graduates contribute to and inspire a vibrant state, national, and global economy. So as we listen to these updates, we get to think about what's the extent to which the what we're having go on at all of these wonderful places is really pointing us in that direction. Uh, so we're going to start today with Superintendent Gettle for the special schools. Thank you. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> President Richard, members of the board, it's a pleasure to give an update on ISD and IESBBI's uh, strategic plan. Um, have our first slide here, and, and our, our goal is to have success for every student every day. The mission of the Iowa School for the Deaf and the Iowa Braille and Sight Saving Schools is to provide education and service as, and serve as a leadership and consultation resource, preparing deaf, hard of hearing, blind, visually impaired, and deafblind students from preschool to age 21 <clears throat> for life as literate citizens who contribute to their communities and society. The priorities of the special schools' strategic plans are to ensure Number one, ensure students are proficient in reading and mathematics through progress monitoring and implementation of appropriate interventions that lead to improved instruction in the classroom. Number two, to increase uh, constituent awareness and utilization of the programs and services offered by ISD and I IESBBI. And three, to promote effective use of resources to meet the goals for continuous improvement of programs and services. To support Priority 1, IESBVI um, established targets for participation and performance in reading for students in grades K through 3. Uh, data was collected during the 
2016-17 school year to establish a baseline for participation and performance with the formative assessment system for teachers that's the FAST that's used across the state uh, for early literacy implementation uh, initiative and the early literacy alternative assessment ELAA for students with additional disabilities. When compared with baseline data participation in FAST remained unchanged and remember students are screened three times a year but uh, that, that screening, fall, winter, and spring, participa participation rates uh, range from 69 to 75%, and then uh, participation in the ELAA increased a bit by 2.6%, ranging from 86 to 90%. So we are more efficient in screening our kids with additional disabilities, it would appear, than the kids that are in uh, the general curriculum taking the FAST. And then uh, in 2017-18, the grade level reading benchmarks assessed with FAST were met by 29% of the students in fall, 26% in winter, and 33% in the spring screening. Um, this is an average decrease of five, a little over 5% from baseline for the three screenings. However, when you compare the, the uh, spring screening periods at the end of the school year for uh, 2017 and 2018, the number of students achieving benchmark increased by almost 4%. Uh, no, I'm just, I, I, I'm sorry, but the print on those slides is so small, I just can't even read to see where I'm at. Yeah, this would do it. <laughs> to support Priority 1 ISD, Iowa School for the Deaf established targets for performance in reading and math for students in grades 3 through 11. Data was collected during the 2016-17 school years to establish baseline for performance with the NWEA measures of academic progress. Uh, when compared with baseline data from fall screening periods, the students showed growth in reading. It increased by 9% to 78%, and students showing growth in math increased by 14% to 81%. These are not measures of proficiency, these are just the percentage of students showing growth over the, over the three screening periods during the year. We also have a three-year average for proficiency, um, and it increased uh, to 51% for reading and 49% in math, and you'll think, well, that's way below what our um, measurements were for the year before, but it just shows that we're, uh, our established three-year average has some very low numbers included in there, and the reason for even measuring or averaging out three years is to see that we're, tr uh, we've, for our cohorts, our grade cohorts, we're continuing a trajectory, an upward trajectory, and closing that gap, if you think about lines, over three years, we're hoping that we, with continued improvement, we're going to see a three-year average that's upwards of 80, 80 percent, then pushing 90 percent. And of course, our target, as we say there, is 100 percent that all students will show growth by, by the end of our uh, strategic plan period. Uh, also to support priority one, professional development activities that improve instruction and academic outcomes for students include training teachers on the use of data gathered through progress monitoring, understanding research-based interventions that address the unique learning needs of deaf and blind students, analysis and application of data for determining intervention strategies, and uh, teacher-led professional development to support increased use of interventions in the classrooms. For priority two, ISD and IESVVI established a goal to increase the understanding and recognition and respect cons constituents hold for the special schools as a state's resource for optimal education services for deaf and blind children. During 2016-17 school year, a work plan was developed and a marketing firm was hired to assist ISD and IESVVI with planning and implementation of strategies for branding, image improvement and marketing. During this last school year, two rounds of structured interviews were conducted with parents, constituents uh, from our partner education agencies, including local schools and AEAs, and local community, establishing a baseline for measuring awareness, perceptions, and understanding of the purpose 
of the special schools programs and services. The information gathered will be used this, this year to inform decisions as we work to develop a clear and unified identity for the special schools programs and services. And then regarding priority three, the special schools established a goal to seek and implement common practices and shared service functions that strengthen operational efficiencies and effectiveness. Data was gathered on special schools program budgets, FTE, and policies and procedures that were then reviewed to determine a baseline for measuring allocation of future resources and alignment of practices between the program areas. Several efforts were implemented to create cost savings and efficiencies in the areas of business services. Uh, One-time savings of $15,000 was generated in FY17, um, and that was realized through purchase of hardware for cloud storage. Ongoing savings generated in FY18 totaled $134,875. Um, that came from implementing new enterprise resource planning software to facilitate joint operations of budgeting, accounting, and payroll for the agencies consolidating information technology purchases and leases and additional cloud storage recovery systems resulting in annual savings of $82,000 in that area, almost $83,000. Uh, then converting from agency-owned vehicles to more cost-effective and efficient vehicle lease and service programs through Iowa State University, and that created an estimated annual savings of $25,000, and then entering a shared service agreement with Lewis Central Community School District for the Director of Food Services, resulting in ongoing savings of $27,000. Work plans were developed to move all administrative and business services off the campus of uh, Iowa Braille and Sight Saving School, um, and then for, to prepare for sale and uh, transfer of that property, that resulted in future decreased operating costs for the Braille School. Approximately 7,800 square feet of space was renovated at ISD to accommodate the Vision Resource Center. Uh, storage for expanded core curriculum materials and equipment and workspace for statewide consultants. Projected ongoing savings generated in FY19 totals $208,475,000. That includes a lease cost savings of approximately $150,000, and then the reduction of a custodial service position, one FTE resulting in 57, almost $58,000. Um, the annual estimated savings of $343,000 represents about 2.4% of the general fund appropriations for the two schools for FY19. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Thank you. President Richards and members of the Board of Regents, thank you for the opportunity to provide an update on the University of Northern Iowa's strategic plan. As President Nook noted, our focus at the University of Northern Iowa is on student success, which is also our unifying goal. The foundation of learning, the learning experience at the university is an education that provides breadth of knowledge across the arts, the humanities, the sciences, and the social sciences, as well as depth of knowledge in a particular major. Surveys of employers repeatedly emphasize the importance of this type of education in the 21st century an education that provides learning in particular skills and offers opportunities for students to apply that learning in real world settings, solving real world problems. This is where the education at the Regents institutions is unique and where all three institutions excel. Our unifying goal, student success, is tracked through the University of Northern Iowa's retention rate of first year students, as well as a whole host of other markers, which is markedly above the expected rate given our student profile. This very high retention rate is the result of a great deal of deep care that our faculty and staff have for our students, as well as the unique opportunities that are provided for students both inside and outside the classroom. To be clear, on our campus, retention is seen as everyone's business. As one example, UNI provides students with opportunities to engage in hands-on research with faculty, very often beginning in their freshman year. These opportunities allow students to gain valuable skills, to discover or confirm career paths, 
work with setbacks and ambiguity, and establish personal, academic, and professional life goals. And we do not only focus on our native students, UNI's commitment to supporting transfer students has been nationally recognized. UNI was one of only 112 institutions named to Phi Theta Kappa's transfer honor roll for excellence and success in community college transfer pathway development. The work of diversity and inclusion, the first supporting goal of our strategic plan, is important for the future of the nation, not just economically as we become more and more interconnected, but also socially as our demographics shift. The number one priority we hear from employers in the Cedar Valley and beyond is the necessity of teaching our students to work collaboratively across difference. One way we measure our work in diversity is through the retention and graduation rates of our underrepresented students. Note that the numbers reported on the slide are five-year averages. We have several strategic initiatives that we have launched to increase diversity and inclusion. You heard several of those in President Nook's report. In a collaboration across the academic colleges, the UNI Textiles and Apparel Program partnered with the university's Hip Hop Literacy Summer School for a Hip Hop Fashion STEM Day Camp. The summer, school, <laughs> the summer school is an eight-week program in which 40 students formed four unique hip-hop music groups, each led by a UNI student teacher. Each group composed and recorded five songs, created social media marketing plans, and designed group logos. And then they presented their design concepts to professional designers from the Target Corporation. Finally, select groups perform their work publicly at the Waterloo River Loop Theater and at the Target Corporate Headquarters in Minneapolis. UNI Center for Urban Education launched the Discover the Dream Mentoring Program in fall 2017. In order to be eligible for Discover the Dream, students from UNIQ Leadership Academy must enroll in the Educational Talent Search Program, which is for 6th through 12th grade students. When they partake in Discover the Dream, they additionally get mentored by UNI students from the Black Student Union, the Center for Multicultural Education, and the Hispanic Latino Student Union. Mentoring takes place weekly, either face-to-face -face meetings, texting, or through letters. Discover the Dream aims to keep these students engaged in school to help them graduate from high school and then hopefully to enroll in post-secondary education. If they make it successfully through all six years, they do get full tuition at the University of Northern Iowa. Campus vitality, our second supporting goal, includes work we do to increase the sustainability of our campus and our revenue streams. The University of Northern Iowa has recently been recognized by the U.S. Green Building Council with a LEED 2009 gold certification after the renovation of the Schindler Education Center. The LEED 2009 Green Building Rating System for Commercial Interiors promotes healthy, durable, and environmentally sound design solutions for building occupants. The design team for the remodel of UNI Schindler Education Center incorporated Energy Star rated equipment throughout the building to save on operating and maintenance costs. The direct result of this effort was a 55% reduction in utility costs for the building, $183,000 per year. In the last academic year, the University of Northern Iowa received almost $40 million in sponsored funding. During that time, we had 100 new agreements with a total of 220 active part project agreements. We had 97 principal investigators, 14 of them were new PIs. About half of the PIs are faculty, the other half are staff and administrators. Our final supporting goal, community engagement, includes work we do preparing our students professionally and providing service to the Cedar Valley and State of Iowa. UNI's Business and Community Services has again been nationally recognized for their work to strengthen Iowa's economies uh, and, and communities. The American Association of State Colleges and Universities awarded UNI's Regional Entrepreneurship Project with the 2017 Excellence and Innovation in Regional and Economic Development Award. In terms of outreach, UNI Speech and Hearing Clinic, which has been in existence since the early 1960s, offers assessments and therapeutic services by students under the supervision of faculty and staff members in the department. The clinic provides services for all forms of speech, language, and hearing disorders for persons of all ages across the Cedar Valley and Northeast Iowa. 
This past year, the clinic provided over 6,300 hours of free service to the community. Finally, UNI is leading the way to ensure Iowa students are prepared for the 21st century workforce. As we just heard earlier today, UNI offers coursework to satisfy the state's newly created computer science endorsement. This endorsement will help meet the goal of Senate File 274 passed in 2017, requiring that every high school offer high quality computer science courses by July 1, 2019. Thank you for this opportunity to provide an update and I would gladly take any questions. Any questions? Thank you. Well, thank you also for the opportunity to uh, brief the board today on progress made at Iowa State University over the past year to move our strategic plan forward. The docket, uh, as you know, already includes a, a written detailed uh, update on performance metrics and bar charts and statistics and different initiatives that we've had to move our four goals forward. So really in the time I have today, rather than go over the facts and figures, what I'd like to do is take you behind the scenes with a few stories to highlight the people, our faculty and staff, who really serve our students in state every day and who des deserve the credit for, uh, for our progress. The first goal of our strategic plan really centers on the quality of academic programs and the accessibility of the Iowa State education. And a key component of access, as you know, is affordability. And while tuition increases are necessary to keep pace with rising costs and to ensure a quality education, we are also very committed to lowering costs for students whenever that's possible. One such area involves offering more economical electronic versions of textbooks and what are called open educational resources, which are really free textbooks and other course materials that are created and shared by Iowa State faculty and faculty around the country. So let me give you a few examples of that. Joe Makowitz and Jenny Ani, who are faculty members in our Department of English, recently saved 1,400 students, a total of $179,000. That's $130 for each student in a single semester just by adopting electronic materials exclusively for their course. And Shekhar Raju, a faculty member in our Ivy College of Business, saved his 780 students nearly $200 each by adopting a similar strategy for a required course in our Department of Marketing. And professors Craig Ogilvie and John Lachoua in our Department of Physics are developing new materials for their physics classes to leverage the free textbooks that they're already using with an expected additional savings of $64 per student. Now this work really adds up and the savings goes directly into the pockets of students. Last year, we saved ISU students over a million dollars through these initiatives, and this year, the savings will exceed $2 million. The second goal of our strategic plan pertains to Iowa State's research and development mission. Our faculty last year secured $246 million in external research funding. That's the second highest level that we have on record. And that represents an investment by others, by federal and state agencies, by companies and foundations, in the ideas and uh, investment in the innovation, really, of our faculty. Those funds, those external funds, come to Iowa to support the salaries of faculty and staff and to support the tuition and stipends for graduate students. So it really does represent a, a growth in Iowa's economy. And our R&D programs, I feel, strike a balance between basic and applied research, and they cut across disciplines in ways that we really would not have imagined even a few years ago. One example shown on the slide here is Professor Artie Singh on the lower left there from our Department of Agronomy and Shomik Sarkar just to the right from engineering. Working together, an, acro an agronomist and an engineer working together, they've developed technology to diagnose common stresses to soybean plants shown there in the photograph, such as iron deficiency, disease, or herbicide injury by using a smartphone. It's literally like holding the expertise of a plant scientist in the palm of your hand. And chemistry professor Javier Vela, wearing safety glasses there in the middle picture, is creating new semiconductor materials for everything from phones to computers to solar energy cells. And Javier's new material turns out to be less toxic, more abundantly available, and potentially more affordable than the current alternatives. And those things that look like grapes in the background picture on the upper right, well, they're called nanoparticles. And each one of those little circles is just three billionths of a meter across. 
Now that's 0.003% the diameter of a hair on one of our heads. But it turns out those particles are large enough to hold microscopic doses of vaccines and other medicines. So Professor Caitlin Bratley, shown there on the right-hand side of the slide, is researching how to use those nanoparticles to selectively kill cancer cells with chemotherapy that's delivered directly and precisely to a tumor. And she's working with colleagues at 21 institutions, including our sister institution, the University of Iowa, through our Nano Vaccine Institute. Since that institute was approved by you last year, it has already secured $20 million in externally funded research grants. Goal three of our strategic plan focuses on Iowa State University as a 99 county campus and extending the work of our faculty across the state of Iowa. Our Center for Industrial Research and Service and our Small Business Development Center play very important roles in that regard. Last year, those programs served 5,700 different companies in every single county of the state. Now, many of the manufacturers that are served by Cirrus and SBDC specialize in unique products and services. And they're important, and they're shipped worldwide, but many times their products and services are often unknown outside of their immediate communities. So I'd like to highlight two examples shown here on the slide. On the left is a company called Artistic Manufacturing, located in Altoona. Perhaps you've never heard of this little company. But they turn out to be the only American manufacturer that still produces a full line of churchware for congregations around the world. I bet you wonder who made all that stuff. Well, Cirrus product manager Shankar Srinivasan provided the technical assistance for artistic manufacturing to develop corn-based compostable communion cups, and their very first shipment went to Iceland last spring. Iowa State students also worked with this company as part of a team-based design learning project to design a new filling system for those cups. The students helped solve a challenge that this company has been grappling with for more than 30 years, and these students now have a patent pending on that technology. The photograph on the right is from a company called Civco Radiotherapy. It's a 36-year-old firm located up in Orange City that makes devices that keep patients still during their radiation therapy. The challenge that this company had was how to verify that the patients were indeed not moving during their procedures in order to have fewer and more effective radiotherapy treatments. Well, Chris Hill and Mark Williamson from Cirrus's Technology Assistance Program helped Civco create a new scanning system to solve that problem. As a result, their product came to market faster, and it saved the company more than $150,000 in R&D cost. These are just two specific examples in little communities around our state where our team is bringing value to Iowa. And the fourth goal of our strategic plan centers on the importance of having a welcoming and safe environment on our campus. This work includes efforts by our Office of Diversity and Inclusion, led by Vice President Reg Stewart, and our ISU Police Department, led by Chief Michael Newton, who you met earlier today in this student affairs meeting. We're very proud of our record multicultural enrollment for fall 2018. Our 7,500 first-generation students at Iowa State University and our record number of multicultural faculty and staff. But recruiting students, faculty, and staff to campus is only the first step in creating a welcoming and inclusive campus experience. So that's why last year, President Winterstein charged the university and we completed a survey of campus climate in order to gain a comprehensive baseline measurement of how we're doing, looking at things like discriminatory behavior and harassment, and the campus experiences that are felt by different populations and groups. President Winterstein has since commissioned four work groups to develop actions and initiatives that are responsive to the findings of the campus climate survey and that will, in time, enhance the experience of undergraduate students, graduate and professional students, postdocs, faculty, and our staff. So in conclusion, thank you again for this opportunity to quickly share with you a little of the story behind the story and I would be very pleased to answer any questions that you may have. Re Regent Dunkel. Thank you. Uh, so your plan was, you're reporting on a one-year plan, one-year strategic plan, is that correct? So this, this is a, a five-year strategic plan. Five years, And okay. this is an update on what we were doing over the past year. Okay, that's what I needed to know, thank you.
I liked your slides, but I think I'll oh, use mine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> um, so let me join the chorus of uh, folks saying that I'm, I'm actually delighted to have a chance to share a few highlights of our progress. Um, and we're in the second year of our 2016 to 2021 uh, strategic plan. Um, as I, I think you might know, um, with the development of the plan, we also developed a new shared governance process for implementing the plan, which we call the Path Forward process. And this uh, is organized around four work groups, three that are aligned around the three pillars of the plan, and then the fourth area represents our commitments to diversity, equity, inclusion, and collaboration, which are foundational commitments that cut across all three of the pillars. The report that you have in front of you is organized around these four work group areas. And it highlights a few key indicators of progress in each area and a very brief assessment of where we stand and where we believe we need to focus our efforts to move forward. There's also an appendix that describe a handful of selected accomplishments and initiatives that illustrate the breadth of activity that's happening across campus in these areas. Now, I really want to emphasize that implementing our strategic plan isn't something that takes place from the top down. It is infused in all parts of the campus. So with uh, today, I'm uh, going to focus on a single example in each area. But first, um, I just want to take a quick look at the bigger picture. Uh, you may not be able to read the graphs on this slide. Uh, you can see them in the full report that you have in front of you. But in this first pillar of student success, we continue to be very proud of how we have improved our four-year graduation rate, but we know we need to keep working harder to try to close the gap between us and our peers. Of course, it takes time for the results of our efforts to show up in charts and graphs like the ones that you see here. We may not see the fruits of our labors fully reflected in these graphs even within the five years of this plan but we're constantly assessing our initiatives with an eye toward whether they will help move these needles in the long run. To illustrate innovations and efforts in student success, I'd like to highlight um, the MAGID Center for Undergraduate Writing. Uh, it's existed since 2011, thanks to a generous gift from the MAGID family. And we're excited to highlight how much it has grown and will continue to do great things, thanks uh, in particular to a recent additional $2 million gift from this family. The center offers students from any undergraduate major on campus opportunities to improve their academic, creative, and professional communication skills. The core of the center's programs is the undergraduate certificate in writing, which is customizable to a student's specific field and has proven very attractive to employers. And enrollment in this program has more than doubled in the past five years, and more than 250 students have earned the certificate so far. So by building on the university's distinction as the writing university, the program is a model example of how we can focus on an area of strength and distinction and make big strides forward in an area of strategic importance. As President Harold highlighted in his update, we were very pleased to see an increase in federal funding for research and in the number of proposals, grants, and contracts that were awarded in fiscal year 2018. And this is particularly exciting given that federal funding has been stagnant over recent years. The pie isn't growing, but our share is. We're not going to take our eye off the ball. Uh, we will continue supporting faculty efforts to pursue funding from alternative as well as federal sources. And of course, the number one goal with regard to promoting research and discovery is to recruit and retain active, diverse, and collaborative faculty. The example I'd like to highlight here is the Center for Advancing Multimorbidity Silent, uh, Silence, <laughs> Science, <laughs> or CAMS, in the College of Nursing. This year, the College of Nursing was awarded a $1.9 million five-year P20 Exploratory Center of Excellence grant from the National Institute of Nursing Research. Now these grants are designed to help institutions with emerging research programs build research expertise 
for the future. CAMS will build research infrastructure and resources to catalyze new interdisciplinary teams to tackle the challenges of conducting research on human adults who have multiple complex chronic conditions, what's known as multimorbidity, which has emerged as a national health care priority. Now, we're very proud of this award, of course, because it's an honor to be designated an NIH Center of Excellence, but even more important because the work is going to lead to improved quality of life for countless people in the future. I'll just mention that our statewide presence and collaboration continues to grow, as does our reach through delivering state-of-the-art health care. Particular note on this slide is the large number of students who are involved in direct engagement as well as in service learning courses. An example in the area of engagement is the business leadership network in the College of Public Health. Since 2011, the BLN has been reaching out to small and medium-sized businesses and communities across Iowa, especially in areas where the college wasn't already well-connected to explore ways to build collaborative partnerships. There are a lot of pieces to the BLN, but the program we've highlighted here is a community grant project, which awards small grants to nonprofits and local government entities to support locally initiated projects to improve community health. This year, the project awarded six new grants in communities across Iowa for projects that promote healthy behaviors, combat food instability, address substance use and mental health issues, and support individuals affected by cancer. And this was the third year for this project, and we've been delighted to keep building such a strong collection of partnerships across the state. Again, I won't dwell on this slide. I will just remind you that our commitments to diversity and collaboration cut across every part of our academic mission. And actually, I was noting the same uh, affordable content project uh, that uh, ISU uh, just mentioned. One example uh, that clearly aligns with student success is the Black Student Success Initiative, uh, also uh, known as Being Black at Iowa. Our survey data have told us that black students feel less like they belong at the university than their majority peers. Retention and graduation rates are lower. These are disparities that we must address by ensuring that underrepresented students feel included on campus and that they have the support they need to succeed academically. BSSI provides opportunities for black students to connect and to receive mentoring and career readiness support. The program creates early intervention plans and provides faculty and staff opportunities to learn how to better support black students. Staff from several university offices are key partners. And I'm pleased to say that retention and graduation rates for black students have increased since the program began in 2015. We've got a lot more work to do, but I look forward to building on this success. So that was a very hurried overview of just a few initiatives, but again, I hope this gives you a taste of the breadth and diversity of activity that is going on across campus as we work to advance our strategic academic priorities. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any questions for any one of the presenters? Thanks, President Richards. I'll quickly update uh, the board on the board's strategic plan. Um, what you've heard already really says a lot, really about, and is a good precursor to, to make my job really easy um, at this point. There's a lot going on, and, and I'll just remind you that the board's strategic plan has three priorities, the first of which is ensuring access to education and student success. Um, a lot has been said about that by our four colleagues here from giving access to young children with auditory and visual impairments to all the variety of ways that our, our students um, at our universities are, are receiving access. Um, another element of that access is financial. We heard a, a good question yesterday from Regent Lindenmeyer about financial aid issues. It's important to uh, point out that we do have $200 million of institutional aid going to our students annually. Um, we did, Regent Lindenmeyer, uh, dig a little bit more. We think it's 
depending on the institution, depending on subpopulations of students, that somewhere between um, 50 to 60 percent of students are receiving aid um, to help support that. Some portion of that is need-based, some merit, so it's a mix of um, things in there. But there's uh, also an important thing to point out that one-third of our students, of our undergraduate students, are leaving with zero dollars in debt. Um, and so that's a part of it. We're using that aid to help ensure that they have access to the education, but then also access to sort of launch into very successful um, careers and outcomes after they leave our institutions as well by keeping those debt numbers down. Um, and I do want to emphasize too that we, we provide access to students all over the state through our distance learning. Um, and on the summary that you've received in your docket as well, you can see the trend lines in that distance learning is continuing to grow and we continue to enroll students today from all 99 counties through various types of distance learning offerings. Uh, so, so there really is a lot of access to education that, that we are working on and ensuring. Um, the other part of that uh, priority one is of course student success and it is um, really exciting to be able to show you that the public university system in Iowa is the number one system in the nation in terms of getting students who start with us to have a degree within six years. Uh, this is fantastic. This is national uh, data that is provided to us through the National Student Clearinghouse um, and we're thrilled with that. Uh, but it's also important to point out, as is in your uh, materials as well, that 85 to 90 percent of the undergraduates at our institutions who are receiving those degrees are also getting various types of experiential and work-based learning on their way to that. So not only are we helping them get degrees, we're helping them uh, enter that workforce really prepared to be very effective. Um, the second priority I am going to mention only very briefly because you had a really nice presentation on economic development from Mary Brown and her colleagues earlier um, and they said it well, millions in revenue to li on, in licensed technology to Iowa companies, over a billion dollars in sponsored funding, research and development, these are exciting things. I will just add that the aspect of this that's focused on innovation and teaching, also you've been a part of by your uh, role in approving new STEM degrees um, in the past few years, all three of our institutions have, have developed new degree pathways that really are helping assure that we're able to contribute in innovative ways to the economic development well into the future as we educate these students. Uh, so that's, that's an exciting development. I'm going so fast. Priority three is our final priority, um, effective use of resources and meeting our missions. Um, and I want to uh, point to yesterday's conversation. There was a nice whole conversation about holistic ways of looking at our resources for our institutions. So the board's already engaged in that conversation. Um, I will emphasize that um, continuing to look at those ways for predictability and all of that are really important to this priority. I want to expand on it just briefly here though. Um, we have had a lot of efficiencies gained in the last few years. You see some of the numbers here. Those top two categories with the eight million in annual savings, um, the 106 million in refinance bond debt. You combine those, we have over 150 million dollars in savings just in the past few years, with the additional 32 million to the state through some of that work. So we've been incredibly good at capitalizing on low interest rates, um, and the role that the board has played in making that happen is pretty important. Um, but I'd like to just briefly remind you that the um, priority really is not just about efficiency, it's about effectiveness, effective use of resources. And you really only get effective use of resources if you have, if you produce something with those savings. And, and what we're producing is important. So I'm going to take the liberty of repeating myself here and say we have the best graduation rate in the nation in terms of what our, our, our universities are producing here, which says a lot to me about effectiveness. And our ability to do that, um, I think, moving forward, will continue to be something that, that we keep an eye on. We don't always have um, good national benchmarks for other ways that we use these savings and, and our resources effectively. So I want to make sure I say we've done a pretty good job of creating graduate level educated doctors and dentists and veterinarians and principals and superintendents and business, there are many, many. We just don't always have the ability to compare ourselves nationally on those levels. It's important to understand them 
And the best way for us to really understand that is often by looking in our communities across the state and seeing how well served they are by all of those professionals that we have a role in producing. Um, so our universities and our special schools are doing a great job at doing this. And I think any of us here would be happy to take any other questions you might have about how we're um, sort of looking strategically forward as an enterprise. Thank you, Rachel. Any questions for Dr. Boone? I'd like to thank everybody for their presentations. Thank you. Uh, before uh, we adjourn today, I, I do want to remind you that uh, in September, the board announced that there would not be a board meeting held on December 5th. Uh, so this will be the last board meeting of 2018. Uh, we will be posting an updated 2019 board schedule on our website soon. Is there any other business to come before the, this board? This meeting of the Board of Regents is adjourned.